Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach, and this is Dadvice TV Live. Now, for those of you that are new, please go ahead and introduce yourself in the comments. We have a great community here that's very supportive, helpful, and positive. And if you are new, let me introduce myself real quick. My name is James and I have kidney disease. I was diagnosed just a few years ago and I was told I had to go on dialysis. But instead of going on dialysis, I worked with renal dietitians, the secret to fighting kidney disease, and my the rest of my healthcare team started exercising, started eating right, started you know working on getting my blood pressure looking better, and I got healthier and healthier. Matter of fact, I got so healthy that I now went from stage five to stage three, but more importantly, I don't have a single symptom of kidney disease. Kidney disease is not holding me back. I like to say I kick kidney disease to the curb. Now it's Tuesday and every Tuesday we have a very special guest with us, Jen Hernandez, who happens to be a renal dietitian. Yes, the secret to living great with kidney disease is working with a renal dietitian. So let's go ahead and welcome Jen Hernandez. Hey, Jen. Hey, James. Hey, everybody. So good to be back again this Tuesday evening with you all live. Yeah, and tell those that are new how they can learn about you and what the heck is a renal dietitian, just in case they're not sure. <laughs> Yeah, it can get kind of confusing. So just like doctors, dietitians can also specialize in different fields. So I am a registered dietitian in the United States. I have gone through my undergrad degree for my bachelor's of science with nutritional sciences. I went through my dietetic internship. I passed my board exam to become a dietitian. And then after I became a registered dietitian, I started working with people with chronic kidney disease in dialysis, which is where I first started really getting into the renal diet, helping people on dialysis. And I did that for several years. And after I did that, I then earned my credential as a board certified specialist in renal nutrition after working with hundreds and hundreds of people with kidney disease. Then I started my virtual private practice, which is plant powered kidneys. And I do that to this day. I help people both privately one on one in the United States and internationally with our plant powered kidneys course. And I really love doing it. I love connecting with the members. We do have a free but private Facebook group. If you haven't found us yet, we have over 3,500 members in there and it's growing and so welcoming and supportive and strong. If you're looking for a community on Facebook that's positive and uplifting and everybody shares a lot of ideas, recipes, that kind of stuff, you should definitely find us on Facebook and join that group. And I'm sure there's a lot of people watching now that can give their two cents as well for the group. Uh, if you are a member in our group, please let other people know because we do want to grow this and make this a supportive community and uh, always love hearing about that positivity. Oh yeah, and I'll tell you guys, I belong to a lot of kidney related Facebook groups, but there's only two out there that I am active in. First one, of course, is Dad Vice TV. There's not a lot going on there. It's pretty much just me posting, hey, here's the next video or upcoming topics. But other than that, I'm just over there in plant powered kidneys, getting recipe ideas, learning about all sorts of cool things, helping keep my meals and my food with a lot of variety and flavor and texture and color. It's great. If you don't belong to it, search it on Facebook, plant powered kidneys and join the group. Now today we're going to be talking about a very popular topic right up here, keto and kidney disease. A lot of people are very excited when they start reading about a keto diet or they go on YouTube and they watch videos about keto diet. Now those people that are out there talking about it, promoting it, they're talking about it for healthy people. Not people like us that have kidney problems or need to watch our fluids and be more careful with what we eat and how much we eat. And I've even found a number of them out there that it's not exactly keto, whatever they're pushing and promoting. Um, right. Yeah, they're, you know, and a, a lot of kidney patients will email me and they'll say, James, what do you think of the keto diet? Have you ever tried it? Well, I did. I did it 
little over a year ago, about a year and a half ago, I tried a keto diet for a, a period of time. Um, and they were like, oh, how can you do it with kidney disease? It's so much protein. No, a keto diet is not high protein. So Jen, for those that are out there, what is a keto diet? So the keto diet has been around for over a hundred years, believe it or not. So even though it's been a trend, it's been coming up in the past couple of years, it's actually been used medically for a long, long time. It's been used primarily for the treatment of, of epilepsy. And it is used still to this day in those cases, especially for children. So a lot of the research, a lot of the studies that we do find, you will see that ketogenic diet is associated in these studies talking about children with epilepsy, because that is primarily how it's been used. Essentially, what the ketogenic diet is, it's utilizing this process called ketosis in our body. This is something that we'll get a little bit into here in just a second to basically change or reroute how your body uses energy. So this is something that is changing the, the basic structure of your energy process in your body. So ketosis is this process in which our fat is broken down and metabolized. And part of this process includes a term called ketone bodies. And these are uh, essentially, they can be created in the liver from the breakdown of the fat, and this is what is used as energy for the body. So the thing about being the, in this state of ketosis is that the diet needs to be high fat and very low carbohydrate in order for this to be actual ketosis, because carbohydrates are typically the main source of fuel for our body. So we essentially need to deplete our body of its normal source of energy in order for ketosis to kick in and for that to become the main way that our body is using energy. Now, and, uh, and I'm gonna, I just grabbed a screenshot of the macronutrients that kind of shows a normal diet, normal-ish, how much of mm -hmm. it normally comes from, our energy comes from, uh, carbs or how many carbs we eat protein and fat and compares that to a um ketogenic one let me bring that up here real quick because so i think this is it yeah. will be really surprising and helpful because so many people do think it's high protein low carb low fat or high fat uh, and that's not true on the protein part it it really depends on these different variations. And that's kind of like how you were saying earlier, James, that people are kind of doing their own thing. It's not mm -hmm. exactly a true keto diet. They're doing a modified version, which may be helpful in some cases, but that's not really what we're looking at here. Here, we're looking at those standard guidelines of what qualifies as a ketogenic. So you see the big difference here is the carbohydrate source drops from the majority, at least, or about half of your diet coming from carbs down to no more than 10%. That's actually about 20 grams per day. And just for the record, an apple is about 15 grams. So oh. it is, <laughs> yes, it is extremely low, this ketogenic diet. And there is a shift of the main source, again, coming from fat, because we're shifting how our body is using our macronutrients. These are the three macronutrients, carbohydrates, protein, and fat. And the protein itself can stay in the moderately low range mm -hmm. if we're shifting the majority to fat. Now, I included in this graph or in this chart here Atkins because a lot of people think of Atkins as a type of ketogenic diet. And we do see some familiarities here. We see that the carbohydrate can be just as low but the protein is bumped up to be quite higher, almost up to four times as high for the modified. And then the fat is not as high as the ketogenic diet. So in this case, the Atkins diet is going to be more of a higher protein type of ketogenic diet. So it's not actually going to really be pushing 
most times into that ketosis state where the body is using the ketones from fat for energy. Yeah. And one of the challenges I had with doing a keto diet a while ago was it is a restrictive diet. Uh, yes. Where a renal diet, like we've been talking, it really comes down to portion control and just making better choices, saying, hey, you can have mm -hmm. that, but it's a lot less. But if you eat this, you can eat more. Keto, there's some big no's. What yeah. are some yeah, of it, those foods I can't have at all? Uh, okay, like this is me turning into Debbie Downer and just being like, know this, know that, which as a dietitian, I never want to have to say, but because we're educating people on this, uh, for the ketogenic diet, the things that are not allowed on ketogenic diet are going to be a lot of beverages. So of course, sodas, which we don't encourage anyway, but even like hot chocolate or juices, which can fit into a regular renal diet, but not on keto. Of course, your breads, your tortillas, any kind of grain you're thinking of, rice, cereal, pastas, oatmeal, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, most fruits, especially dried fruit, because they're higher in carbohydrates or higher in sugars, uh, your potatoes, which you can have on a renal diet, your peas, your corn, your starchy vegetables, you can't have those. I just had corn Alcohol. for dinner. It was delicious. I, right? All this good <laughs> stuff. And here we are in this so it, it is a tough, it is a tough diet. Um, alcohol is essentially off the table. Uh, flavored yogurts and even some different types of non or unflavored yogurts can be off depending on the carbohydrate count there as well. And of course, beans, nuts, or legumes, uh, those are off the table and any kind of sweetener, of course, that you would add. So any, any sugar or honey, agave nectar, that kind of stuff that people like to include, not going to be okay. Yeah, and, and when you guys think about it, if you're thinking of, of doing a ketogenic diet, um, that's a lot of stuff that's on that do not eat. And, and you know, just to let you guys know, it's not like don't eat it often. It's a no, never type thing. Right. If you're going to really stick to the diet and stay in ketosis. Yeah. Another, another idea of how strict it is, uh, for those of you that are familiar with the old school food pyramid, right? So it goes all the way down and the very bottom is your grains and your fruits and your vegetables. You basically chop off that whole bottom area and you're focusing on that top or no, the middle-ish kind of area, but you also chop off that top part because the top part includes the sugars and things like that. So you're really narrowing it down into a very small area of the general guidelines for things that we can eat. It just depends on our, like James says, on our portions and moderation. Yeah. Now, since it it's extremely, or I like to think of it as ultra low carb, high good fats, because there's, mm -hmm. there's some that are better than others. What are some of the things that are typically, you know, encouraged to eat on a ketogenic diet? So on a traditional ketogenic diet, things that are promoted are going to be your cheese, your heavy cream, seafood, butter, um, meat and poultry and eggs, uh, oils, especially plant-based oils, even uh, some avocado and your low carb veggies. So we're thinking peppers and onions, greens like kale, that kind of stuff that doesn't have essentially any carbohydrates. That's going to be the basis of, uh, of the diet for ketogenic. Now, when we look at, when we look at things related to kidneys, that's where we kind of start to see how there's going to be some conflicting information if you're working on preserving your kidney function. So that's when it comes into really getting individualized of what's going on with your kidneys and the ketogenic diet. Yeah. And oh my goodness, some you know, what you just mentioned, most of those sound like things that I enjoy eating, but also mm -hmm. on that list of no, there's a lot of those that I enjoy eating. Um, now, so if I go on a ketogenic diet, are there any side mm -hmm. effects that I may face by having such a strict and limiting diet or diet. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Uh, part of the transition of the body getting used to this shift in using a different source of energy is something that a lot of people associate as the keto flu. And this is where you have low energy, brain fog, even headaches can occur. Another issue that can also happen with a ketogenic diet is constipation. And if you think about, I just kind of ran through that list of the foods that are included. A lot of it are animal sources or dairy products not a lot of fiber. So constipation is a real risk when it comes to following a ketogenic diet. It's not that it is unavoidable. That's where um, it's really, really important to work with the dietitian if this is something you're interested in, because they're, for one, they're going to help clear and make sure that that diet's safe for you and effective for you. And two, they're gonna help give you ideas of how you can actually shift it into a more high fiber diet that still follows a keto type guideline. Maybe not the exact uh, ratios of those macronutrients, it could be. And some dietitians, uh, renal dietitians even, do know about this process and are really trained and specialized in this. So it's absolutely possible, but really the number one thing is finding the right teammate, the right dietitian to help guide you through this process. Um, okay. And then I kind of got, I, I kind of got sidetracked with that. Uh, other side effects that can happen include reflux. So you can get heartburn. You might get some changes in your gut health. Again, you're changing the types of pre and probiotics that are going into your system. Not going to be as much coming from those animal products. You might have changes in your lipid panel. So your cholesterol, your high, uh, your HDL, your LDL, your triglycerides, those labs might change. Now, over the long term, we need to pay attention to that as well. If how if if the ketogenic diet is working and things like that, that's something to be monitoring. But other things that you can see are low blood sugars, low blood pressure, some people experience nausea and vomiting, and uh, even uh, diarrhea or dehydration are also potential side effects of the ketogenic diet. Yeah, and I'll tell you, the constipation one, I can see why there's so yeah. little fiber. The foods that are rich in fiber, you're, you're pretty much avoiding those. And one thing I have learned or, or that I've kind of, one thing I decided, you know, after all these years of having kidney issues and needing to be careful with what I eat is I don't like taking pills. I'll take my blood pressure medicine. I take what I need, but... I don't, I want to eat my nutrients. Mm -hmm. I want to eat mm -hmm. something and get my fiber. And you guys know, I absolutely love apples. Apples are not a keto friendly food, especially those yeah. ones I get. I like those big giant ones, not the little <laughs> tiny ones. I like the big ones. <laughs> oh, delicious. So that would definitely, that would definitely send you over that 20 gram a day. Guideline. Exactly. Just from one snack. Just one just one Not and then even literally meal. yeah and to, then to think like zero carbs for the rest of the day is is it's very very i'm not going to say impossible but i'm going to say very 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 difficult yeah i i did it i did it for a couple months but i i i could not do it for years <laughs> you know mm. now with the restrictive diet I've got to think there are nutrients that I'm not getting since I'm not really eating the rainbow and all the different foods that are out there. Yes. So if you decide to follow a ketogenic diet and you go into this restrictive way of eating, just beware that this can set you up for a lot of other problems down the road, because this is like we talked about last time in our in our other videos about the vitamins, these potholes that come up in the road. So that comes, it creates these other issues from these micronutrients, which are our vitamins and our minerals, electrolytes. Those can become deficient, and this could become from either this can either come from B vitamins because those are found in a lot of whole grains calcium, which is found in the dairy and some dark greens, vitamin D. Uh, there was actually some research that showed uh, fat soluble vitamins, uh, A and E, along with magnesium were shown to be decreased in a study that was following children who were on the ketogenic diet. 
So that is something to be aware of. And again, it's really important to help prevent those micronutrient deficiencies. It's so, so important to work with the dietitian so that you can kind of get ahead of that. And your dietitian can also help you plan for that and help fill in those nutritional gaps by giving you recipe ideas and giving you lists of foods that you should be including in your diet to help out with that. And then worst case scenario, if you do need to have a supplement, your dietitian can help with giving you the right kind of supplement program or supplement regimen to help make sure that you are on the right track and you're not taking pills that you don't need, but you are taking supplements that are going to support this health goal of yours. Yeah. And speaking of supplements, are keto analogs always used with the ketogenic diet? So it sounds like it would be because they have that keto term in there, but they're actually not associated. So keto analogs, uh, if you'll remember, we did a talk a while back. We're probably due to refresh that content as well and give you guys some updates on there. But keto analogs are associated with a low protein diet. So, or a very low protein diet. So this is something that is often recommended for people with late stage CKD. So stage four, stage five, not on dialysis. Keto analogs are something that helps supplement that protein component that's missing. It is not associated with the ketogenic diet. It's, it's a totally different macronutrient, different situation. And for the record, keto analogs are considered a medical food. So it's something that actually should be monitored very, very closely, not something Thing that gets taken on a whim. You want your nephrologist to know, you want your dietitian to know because it is part of your nutrition protein balance. So keto analogs are very important to take under the medical supervision of your nephrologist and your dietitian as well, but it's not associated with the ketogenic diet. Yep. And for anyone out there who's thinking, Hey, I want to do keto. It sounds like James is not on board with keto. I am. If you're working with your renal dietitian, work with your dietitian, yeah. they will help guide you. For me, keto did help me lose a lot of weight. I mean, a lot of weight really quick. I got my blood sugar under control, but then I stopped doing the keto diet. <laughs> my weight has magnetically returned for the most part. <laughs> and that's the challenge control. with well, that's the challenge with the diets that are started with the idea of weight loss, mm -hmm. that if it's if it's the thing of I'm going to do this until I lose a certain amount of weight or something like that, that is not a sustaining measure because you're not going to continue to lose weight. Uh, if you do it for for health reasons, that could be something that's really important. So that's why personally, I like I like to recommend a plant based renal diet for most people. Although there are some people that can benefit even in the renal and the kidney world, there are some people that can benefit from a keto diet, but that's where it gets a lot more into the nitty gritty about who should be following that. And again, you got to have a dietitian on board there because they're going to be the one to track and help make sure that you're getting enough of those nutrients. Yeah, I tried doing it myself. I watched a ton of YouTube videos, lots of people out there who are promoting it and they're having a lot of success, but they're talking about healthy people. Um, I tried doing it myself. It didn't go well. Mm -hmm. Then I, I talked to the dietitian and she said, okay, here's what we need to do. If, if what's your goal? <laughs> I said, I need to, I want to get my blood pressure or uh, my blood sugar. I'm pre-diabetic. I don't want to be pre-diabetic. I want to be normal on my A1C and I also want to lose weight. And she adjusted it, gave me healthy fats because I was not eating healthy fats. I was eating bad fats too. <laughs> and we worked together and then something clicked and it just worked. I just had difficulty because it is so restrictive. Mm -hmm. So let's go a little bit further with keto and now keto and kidney disease which yeah. is really the, the big thing we want to know. So the first question, will keto diet help or hurt my creatinine levels? So this is definitely something, and I know that we always, people always want to be asking about creatinine and what can I do for creatinine? How can I lower it? Creatinine is simply 
a waste product that is naturally occurring in the body, but it just builds up over time with chronic kidney disease. So this is not something that is necessarily associated with a lot of dietary things. And the way I explain it to a lot of my clients is to say, think of the creatinine as the end of the road, even after GFR, really. Making other changes can result in better kidney function with the GFR, the filtration rate, which can help clear creatinine. So that's the end game. But we need to look at what's way, way earlier than that. With the keto diet, there's no research at this time that even focuses on the keto diet and creatinine levels. So we don't even have anything to say necessarily that there's a direct correlation there. There was a study that measured the effect of creatinine clearance between a low carb, high protein or a low fat diet, not ketogenic diets. But even in this study, they were just focusing on weight management. They excluded people with serious medical con conditions, including kidney disease. So even there, it's not something that they're looking at kidney disease in relation to keto creatinine. So there is in that study, they found that those healthy individuals, even obese, even having a larger body frame or larger weight, they saw that there wasn't any harmful effect on their GFR. But it just ended up saying, we need to study this more, more research is needed. And again, that study did not discuss or focus on kidney disease. It looked at people with healthy functioning kidneys and not looking at kidney damage. Yeah. Now, most kidney patients have high blood pressure, me being one of them. Uh, how does the keto diet impact our blood pressure? Is there anything there I need to worry about or keep an eye on? Well, many people with kidney disease have blood pressure, and this is typically seen as hypertension because it's the, one of the top causes of kidney disease. With this, uh, there was a study that was done in 2020 and it was performed on rats, and they found that a ketogenic diet resulted in an aggravation of hypertension. So at that time, they were recommending avoiding a keto diet for high blood pressure. There was a review in 2017 that also looked at some other articles and studies and said that there is some potential improvement for blood pressure, but they couldn't say if it was related to the ketogenic diet itself or if it was related to the weight loss result, because a lot of people know that losing weight and being active and eating better, that all of that can connect into having improved blood pressure. So there's really evidence on both sides of it, both sides of it. But in one side, we're seeing that the improvements, we don't know for sure if the keto diet is going to be helping blood pressure or not. Awesome. Um, what about blood sugar and insulin? So this is definitely a, we could probably do a whole episode talking just about this. This is something that's really, really important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I'll tell you, I know that when, you know, for me, keto was attractive because of its promotion as something that helps with rapid weight loss but also because for those that are pre-diabetic, and I specify pre-diabetic, it can be helpful. Mm -hmm. And it might be, the thing that's really, really important to pay attention to is with this change with ketosis, there can be very dramatic shifts when it comes to the insulin levels in your system. So this can change very quickly and very dramatically. So if you are on insulin, if you are taking insulin and you want to follow a keto diet, you absolutely must get it cleared by your healthcare team because you can be at risk of very low blood sugars, high levels of insulin floating through your system, and that is not a good thing to happen. This is something that can go into metabolic acidosis and it changes the way our body is reacting to this current state. So with that being said, you want to be very, very careful. And this I'm gonna say, especially for those with type one, diabetes or insulin dependent diabetes, 
that I'm talking to you. You are not in this category of thinking about the keto diet because your body is really relying on that insulin feed that you're getting. And to make that drastic change with keto is very, very super, super risky and literally can happen very quickly. Cool. Now, ketosis is what we want to get into. We, we're eating this certain way and our body makes that shift from burning um, carbs to now burning mm -hmm. fat. And we produce ketones because we're in ketosis. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between ketosis and ketoacidosis? Yeah, it's, it sounds really, really close. So the ketosis is, again, when we're using our body, when we're using the ketones for the energy production instead of glucose, instead of carbohydrates. Ketoacidosis, though, this is where there is too much ketones. So you might be familiar with the ketone test strips that people talk about, either getting them by blood or by urine. Uh, that will measure the ketone level in the body. So there's a certain range of ketones that is considered to be in ketosis, which is 0.5 to about three. And over three, that's when you're at risk of being in ketoacidosis, having too much ketones. And this is where the body becomes acidic. And this is where you can experience diabetic ketoacidosis. So people with type one, again, are at a higher risk of developed developing this problem because there's no insulin being produced in the body. It's insulin that you're putting into your body. So it's again, very, very important to make sure your healthcare team knows and that you understand how to be tracking and monitoring the keto range for your ketosis to make sure you're in the right safe range and you're not in a range of being too high to cause diabetic ketoacidosis. Yeah, and I have a relative, uh, one of my nieces, very young, and she's type 1 diabetic. And sometimes she has pain from too many ketones, and that's that ketoacidosis. And um, it's a serious thing that they've got to keep an eye on. Now, you mentioned earlier cholesterol levels. For kidney patients, what does that mean? Well, it's very, very common that people with kidney disease also have abnormal cholesterol levels. So sometimes you'll see high cholesterol or high triglyceride levels, or you might see low HDL, which is the good cholesterol that helps remove and clear cholesterol out of the body. So some studies have shown that the keto diet can reduce total cholesterol. It can reduce LDL, which is the low density, uh, the bad cholesterol and or triglycerides. There's also some evidence that the keto diet can improve HDL, which is the good cholesterol. But with a lot of these diet, uh, with a lot of these studies, they're not looking at keto and kidney disease. They're looking at the cholesterol panel. So this is another association where we're looking at how it's impacting the cholesterol levels, whether or not that's going to be connected to kidney disease. We don't really know, but there's a lot of people keeping a close eye on this and there is more research coming out as with keto and kidney in general, there's a lot of new research coming out. So there's, no kidney disease being associated with these labs or with these uh, with these studies related to cholesterol and they do measure urea and creatinine in some of these studies but they're not showing improvements in that case so they're looking at the cholesterol and they're seeing basically the renal side is unchanged now what about for those in our audience let's start with those that are stage three or better They've got a mm -hmm. GFR, what is that, of over 30. Actually, wow, that's that's quite a bit. 30 all the way up to 120 for a super healthy young adult. Um, what are kind of your general recommendations? Of course, everyone's health is different. We all need to work directly with our healthcare team and our own renal dietitian mm -hmm. who knows our labs. But what's your general recommendation for those that their GFR, you know, it's it's over 30. Well, for a lot of people with stage three and earlier CKD, there's a bit more flexibility. We're not in this time crunch necessarily as we are in the later stages, the stages that are closer approaching dialysis or those that are on dialysis. So when you have less kidney function, we have to be really, really aggressive 
but careful with what we're doing. With earlier CKD, there might be some benefits with keto or even a flexible type keto diet, which can help in some cases, especially with the weight loss. So that's going to be one of the primary focuses that so many people look to the keto diet for is to help with that weight loss. So there was a study that was done not too long ago. It had a uh, uh, over 90 patients and they were classified as obese and they were put on a severely restrictive, very low calorie diet. And I'm talking about less than 800 calories per day. That's less than what a child would eat. But they also had them on a high protein intake and they had them on this diet for 15 weeks. For the record, this is what makes nutrition science so difficult to try to wrangle a group of people that will follow a very strict diet for this long period of time is really, really challenging. But they and had even this- 15 weeks isn't that long when you think of the, you know, your lifetime, but yeah. when you're on a restrictive diet, that's, oh. that is a lifetime. Day three, I'd be out at 100%. I'd, nope, not doing that, not doing that but they had them doing this very, very restricted diet. And they focused on uh, particularly looking at more of the weight uh, to see how that would affect in relation with the ketogenic diet. They did note that of the 90 something participants that a little bit over a third of them, so about 35 were classified as early CKD stage two. So they did note that the creatinine levels across this group were all stable. So these people were early CKD, but not uh, having a, a significant changes in their labs and their health. In this study, some of the participants that were early CKD stage two, they did report what they called was full recovery of kidney function. But they also acknowledged that there's factors, including the weight loss, that may have been what resulted in that kidney function change. So they weren't saying necessarily that the keto diet or even the very low calorie diet specifically were attributing to that result. And that's again, where they say that it's very important that we need to be able to replicate this. We need to replicate this kind of study to see if that is something that could happen. They also really emphasized across the paper, they talked about the importance of this being a medically supervised diet. This is something that these participants were seeing a full team. They had nutrition education, they had dietitians there on standby talking with them every single day and monitoring their labs, including their micronutrients. They had them on specific supplements to prevent deficiencies. So it was something very, very tightly monitored and needs to be, if replicated, needs to be tightly monitored there as well. And that is something that is so, I cannot stress how important that is. This is not a try at home and just see how it goes kind of a thing because doing the wrong thing with your diet can result in a significant drop in your kidney function. Yep. Now, what about those of us that have worse kidney function? We're below 30, we're stage four, we're stage five, not, not on dialysis. What are your general recommendations on doing a keto diet? So at this time, there's no studies for people with late stage kidney disease. So stage four, stage five on dialysis. There's no studies about people late stage with ketogenic diet. So we can't look to anything there. There was a study that was done looking at uh, the long-term ketogenic that was performed on rats. They found that it induced side effects like metabolic acidosis, anemia, and oxidative stress. And these are all potential side effects of chronic kidney disease, especially for people in later stages of chronic kidney disease. So again, this is something we're trying a, a certain type of diet without having that monitoring can result in more potholes down the road. Now, what about those that are on a, that have poly, polycystic kidney disease, 
we miss talking about that so often. And I always get comments, mm -hmm. people say, hey, what about this one? Don't forget about us. Oh, yeah. I mean, the number, the, the different reasons and causes of kidney disease, there are so many different causes. It's really hard to, it, it's a lot to go down to all those different avenues, but we try. So with polycystic kidney disease, there is some pretty interesting research that is coming out relating polycystic PKD to the ketogenic diet. So there was a study that focused on a PKD keto diet, but it was looking at rats, mice, and cats. They did find though that in this ketogenic diet, there was a decrease in cyst growth with a very strict diet and supplement protocol. So this is an animal study and oftentimes we can think about how it could be moved into human studies. We're not the same, we are not animals, but there is that potential of thinking, okay, if this is how it worked, can we then expand into thinking that this could be how it works for humans? It's hard to say. And that's where some people will start thinking about um, some even, even practitioners and, and doctors will start looking at what that really means. So just keep in mind that it's an animal study. There's no current published current research that that's published with humans with PKD and the keto diet. But again, once they have animal studies coming out and they show uh, some promise like that decreased cyst growth, that is really what helps to get the ball rolling in further research into seeing how this can be uh, applied towards humans. Now, we've talked many times in the past about one of the more painful things to keep an eye out for, uh, that those of us with kidney disease are at more of a risk to develop, kidney stones. Does keto increase the chance that I'm going to have these painful and very annoying kidney stones? It's possible. There, again, a lot of the, yeah, a lot of the ketogenic studies that have been done are on children. There's been case studies. There's a case study where a young girl would ended up developing kidney stones. And this is where it goes into looking at the shift of the acidity that we mentioned about the body getting into a more acidic state, which can change the pH and can change what is what is in the urine. And that is where the kidney stones will be formed. So it's very important to keep that in mind. If you have kidney stones, the keto diet is probably not gonna be your first stop when it comes to the diet to help out with kidney stones. It's not going to solve that problem. They found that high calcium levels were found in and an increased kidney stone kidney stone formation in just three months into the diet. So they found that kidney stones are associated with the ketogenic diet, at least in regards to the studies that have been done with children. So in those cases, if you do a ketogenic diet, you want to have the key or the kidney stones treated prior to even attempting the ketogenic diet, because the last thing you want to do is aggravate those kidney stones. Mm -hmm. So many people get prescribed supplements, medication like potassium citrate that help with reducing the risk of kidney stones. So you definitely, definitely want to get that addressed first. And if you're working with a dietitian and you're interested in the keto diet, be sure to disclose if you have a history of kidney stones, because that could be a red flag. It could be something that they want the dietitian or the doctors want to pay attention to in this dietary change. And for those of us that have ever had kidney stones, you want to only have them once. Once you've had them, you never want them again. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of the foods that I can eat that are kidney friendly that fit within a keto diet. So we really, if you get the green light, I'll, I'll say that first. If you get the green light from your doctor, from your dietitian to follow a ketogenic diet, 
think about those low carbohydrate veggies because we want to decrease that risk of the acid. We want to decrease that risk of a low fiber diet that leads to constipation and GI issues. And that fiber also helps with keeping a healthy gut. So think about the good um, low carbohydrate veggies. So peppers, onions, even cabbage and cucumber. One of the ones that I think is really fantastic that gets overlooked probably because it's not the prettiest, but jicama is a great low carb veggie to use and it has a uh, prebiotics in it as well. So it really is a double benefit for your gut health if you have some jicama, which is kidney friendly by the way. And then when you're looking at fats, because a good chunk of your diet will be coming from fats, make sure you're choosing healthy plant-based fats and you're not looking for an excuse to double down on that stick of butter or adding lard or grease, things like that. Exactly. You don't want to be adding those kind of fats. You still want to use healthier fats to serve the foundation of your diet on a ketogenic diet. Yeah, and, and, you know, a lot of the online YouTubers that promote a ketogenic diet, they're, they're showing a lot of dirty fats, they call them. Mm -hmm. That is your butter. That is bacon. That is mm -hmm. fried bacon hamburgers grease. and stuff like that. Yeah, it's grease. They're saying eat grease. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of bad things that come from that. So what are some good sources of, of fats, like the oils that you talked about? What are some of those? Well, two of my favorite, absolute favorites are uh, olive oil, and avocado oil. Oh yeah, same I use, here. I use <laughs> I use olive oil for my salad dressings, for any kind of light cooking, sometimes even roasting. Avocado oil though, that's my go-to for cooking because it stands up to higher temperatures compared to the olive oil. Olive oil we know is more fragrant, so that one is nicer when you have it with uncooked foods. But avocado oil is great, even sesame oil. We've talked about that, about that before with your stir fries. I think sesame mm -hmm. oil adds a really great flavor to it. The smell of it is nice and strong. A little goes a long way in general, but sesame oil is great. Uh, safflower, sunflower, and even canola. And I know a lot of people have um, concerns about canola oil, but it is a plant-based oil. So still used in moderation is totally fine. Yeah, and I absolutely love cooking with olive oil avocado oil and sesame oil because those of you who have watched for a while you know my number one the first thing i learned to cook because when i was diagnosed with kidney disease my cooking came down to either ordering delivery or pulling up to a speaker and telling them what i wanted and picking it up at the window i had no <laughs> clue how to cook but i learned how to make stir fry with lots of different vegetables you know, some, some, uh, maybe some, uh, um, almonds, slivers, things like mm -hmm. that. Oh, so many things. And you add these oils and other things and you just change the flavor so much. You could do with something so simple and kidney friendly. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the challenges, and we're getting close to the top of the hour here. One of the mm -hmm. challenges I had was I just couldn't keep it up. I was traveling as pre COVID my work schedule. Um, it was very difficult for me to stay eating ketogenic mm -hmm. because you, you just can't walk up to the vending machine because you've had a busy day at the office and hit the button for the keto food and it pops out. Right. Um, it really, really took pre-planning what I was going to eat. And when I traveled, you got to plan the whole week if I'm going to be gone a mm -hmm. week. Mm -hmm. um, is that one of the bigger challenges you see? Because that was my biggest challenge with the keto oh, diet. Yeah. Finding foods I could Absolutely. eat and planning it out. Absolutely. That is, I mean, in general, following any kind of diet, planning is huge. It really, really is big in making sure that you're doing the best thing for yourself. With the ketogenic diet being so restrictive, you really, really need to plan ahead. You need to know what you're eating because if you get to that time where you are trying to figure that out, you don't know what to have, that is where you risk possibly having something that puts you out of ketosis. And that takes a few days to get you into ketosis. There is no such thing as a cheat day. So 
if you're out to eat and you're thinking, oh, you know, one meal won't do anything in this diet, it will. It can take you out of ketosis. So it's important to know have a game plan. And that's where I was just actually talking with one of my clients uh, last week. I think it was last week. We were planning out their vacation for June or July. Again, time to me in this time of everything going on does not mm. matter. Uh, but <laughs> they're, they're looking down later in the year to go on a vacation. And we were planning out meals and ideas for them of what they could do at that time. So it's really, really important to plan it out and to know those kind of situations. Don't say, I'm never going to eat out. I'm not going to go see friends. I'm not going to do this because that's not realistic. You're not exactly. going to avoid those situations. They're going to happen and it's better to plan for them to, than to ignore them. Now, if someone out here is like, you know what? I really want to go on a ketogenic diet. What are like the few bits of wisdom they need to take away because we've covered a lot of stuff that mm -hmm. will help them be most successful and not, you know, accelerate kidney damage. So number one, you absolutely should be telling your nephrologist and whether or not they agree with you, I'm sure they're going to give you their two cents on if that's okay. And whether or not you take that into consideration, that's between you and your nephrologist. But you've got to tell them. You need them to know what's going on. Because if anything, they can at least get some labs to track and help follow what's going on. And if they can connect you with a dietitian, that's my next recommendation, is work with the dietitian. No matter what stage of kidney disease you are in, working with a dietitian is like turning the light on in the room. You see what's going on. You know what's going on. And you can take care of that. Otherwise, you're going to be wandering around in the dark trying to figure it out. And of course, I'm kind of biased because I'm a renal dietitian, but I'll say that I've seen it time and time again, both with my clients and my private practice, but then also with people on dialysis who did try these crash diets. They knew that dialysis was down the corner and they thought that they could fix it. And they did something that ended up just really damaging their kidneys further. And so on both sides of it, I highly, highly recommend that you work with a dietitian. Yeah, and I'll tell you about, about two weeks ago, I had a broadcast on a Monday, or I can't remember what day it was, but the guests had technical issues and she wasn't able to attend. And someone asked me, James, what's the one thing you did that helped you the most? And that was, I learned, you know, I said, I educated myself. That was the most important thing, but I used the resources available to help educate myself. And I didn't do things alone. And the biggest thing that I did was working with the renal dietitian. They not only helped me to learn or to find what to eat, they taught me why. And I suddenly so much clarity came to the diet. The renal diet originally, you know, for me, even just a renal one, it looked like it was all restrictive. A ketogenic diet is a very restrictive diet, making it even more challenging. Mm -hmm. But by working with the renal dietitian, they are that guide. They're the map. They're the, you know, helping you get through all these challenges so that you don't fall down. You don't get stuck. You don't cause harm to yourself when you think you're trying to help yourself. So I encourage everyone out there, if you're not working with a renal dietitian, especially if you're at the, you know, the lower end of kidney function, you gotta, and mm -hmm. I would encourage everyone, even your GFR 60, have a couple visits, talk to a dietitian. Oh, yeah. There you're is so learn. much we can do. Yeah. It's amazing <laughs> what mm -hmm. all you can learn. Now mm -hmm. we are at the top of the hour, but I wanted to address real quick. One question or a couple, it's a comment that Jules had. And thank you, Jules, for the super chat. I really appreciate that. That helps cover some of the cost of all this stuff. I like that. Oh, that's um, great. She was, let's see, I don't know if it's a she or a he. Jules, he or she, was diagnosed with the GFR 50. And they were devastated. It says they cried for four days. Um, believe me, I understand that any diagnosis of kidney damage 
is devastating, especially when you go online, you start doing some Google searches. And I oh, know yeah. the searches you've done. I know it's what you've done. Yeah, it's all scary. It's all doom and gloom. Yeah. Jules, I was diagnosed, had no clue, GFR 8. Now, not everyone is in the same, but we all are different. That is another huge thing. We are all different. Mm -hmm. I worked with my doctors. I listened. I learned. I learned about nutrition. Some people say, oh, you can't eat an avocado. And they hear us talk about avocados. I eat avocados. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not that you can't eat an avocado. It's that you can't have too much potassium. And yeah, there's a lot of potassium right. in there. So you have some avocado. Right. And you, you cut out the potassium somewhere else. Have a little less at dinner, a little less here. And you can find ways to get the food to fit your diet. Um, mm -hmm. being diagnosed with a GFR of 50, I'm going to say, actually, this might sound sh shocking, Jules, congratulations. You found out very, very early. A yeah. lot of people discover kidney issues almost when it's too late. They're mm -hmm. finding out when they need dialysis. On dialysis. Yeah, that's, that's where I was. They wanted to put yeah. things in my neck down to my mm -hmm. heart and hook up dialysis while I was in the ICU for a week. And I begged, I said, no, give me a chance. I'm gonna change, no more Dr. Pepper, no more McDonald's, it's gone mm -hmm. now, never again. Uh, I was very lucky. With a, a GFR of 50, your question is, can you get it higher? There is no guarantee, but the chances, mm -hmm. oh my goodness, of getting from a 50 up even more is great. Mm -hmm. And a 50, really doesn't mean anything. Symptoms can easily be managed at a GFR in the upper 20s and higher. And as a matter of fact, my goal originally, my doctor, my good doctor, because I had some that weren't that great, he just wanted me to get to 19. He's like, look, if you can get to a GFR 19, I can hold you there. I can keep you there for decades. You'll be fine. We can manage your symptoms. Um, and the closer I got to 30, the easier the symptoms were to manage. And I got rid of all of them as I got close to GFR 30. Now I can go out, I'm fat. I still gotta lose weight, but I can go yeah. do whatever I want. Kidney disease is not holding me back. So Jules, I wanna tell you, you're in a great place with the GFR yes. 50. I know it sounds devastating, yes. but you're in a fantastic place. Learn what can hurt your kidneys, don't do that. Learn about nutrition and mm -hmm. live healthy. Those are the two mm -hmm. words. If I if I just left two words of advice to everybody, it's live healthy. By living healthy, you're going to protect your heart. You're not going to die of kidney stuff. You're going to you're going to your your kidneys are going to cause heart problems and other issues. Live healthy so you can protect your heart. Um, eat healthy, be active. Uh, manage stress. I have a great video of the eight steps my doctor laid out to getting better. One of them is managing stress. Stress is bad on your kidneys. Um, and I've got tons of videos out there documenting my journey going from, a, when the doctors diagnosed me, they told me I had to go on dialysis. And this is heartbreaking. And I'm sorry to keep you here so long, Jen. It's, I just want to really That's encourage okay. Jules to feel better. <laughs> Yeah. Oh um, yeah. I I'm I'm right there with you. Yeah. The doctor, the original, and she had the worst bedside manners, but it worked. It, it made it sink in. She told me at one point, you need to go on dialysis now. If you don't in 45 days, your wife will be picking out your casket. I was stuck there in the ICU thinking of, oh my goodness, I have to go on dialysis. My life's going to change or I die. And these doctors, white coats, fancy people with great educations are telling me this. It was devastating, mm -hmm. but I stayed positive. I, I saw that so many people have done so much with diet and lifestyle changes. And that's what I promote. There's no magic fix. There's no magic pill. None of those work. Jen and I have tons of videos talking about it. It comes down to living healthy. So Jules, I want you to live healthy. I want you to love life and encourage other people to be healthy too so that they don't end up with that devastating diagnosis. The diagnosis, especially at GFR 50, is far worse than living with a, a, a 50. Now, chances are very good 
know, depending on the cause of your, your kidney issues, mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. very good, Jules. You can live the rest of your life and never, ever have to worry about dialysis if you focus on living healthy. So I encourage mm -hmm. you to do that. And everyone else out there that, that's, that's, you know, in the same boat, everyone, we all got kidney disease. Uh, kidney disease isn't you. You can do so much to take control of your life and, you know, feel great, do the things you want. Now, some of us at one point, we may need dialysis. Some of you may be on dialysis and dialysis isn't the end of the world. And there are so many things coming just around the corner that will make dialysis better. I've talked to so many researchers and, and people who are developing stuff. Um, we're a decade or so away from an implantable kidney that can help so you don't have to go into the dialysis centers, you know, that's not that far away. If you think about it, mm -hmm. when was 2000, you know, let's go back 15 years. Don't, no, let's not play the, let's not that play the time that game. Ago. That was like a blink ago. We can do it. I know, it. it's sad. It's sad. <laughs> I think 2006, wasn't that when YouTube got started? It feels like it's always been around, but yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, so I, I hope, I hope, Jules, that helps you feel better. And I hope that helps other people out there. I had to get up on my soapbox. This is my thing. I'm going to advocate for better kidney health. You got people like Jen here, renal dietitian, uh, helping so many kidney patients live a better life, enjoy life, improve the quality of life. Ignore all the scary stuff you found. I know you did the searches. I know you looked up life expectancy. It's all BS. There's no number for anybody out there. Mm -hmm. It all comes down to living healthy. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and I'll, up. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I'll help wrap things up by just putting out my reminder that okay. in about 20 minutes, I am going to be going on Instagram. So if you all follow me on Instagram, it's plant.powered.kidneys on Instagram. If you follow me there in 20 minutes, I'm going live with three other renal dietitians that are here, uh, not only the US, there's one of them that's in Puerto Rico. Uh, so which is technically still the US, but uh, she speaks Spanish. So I'm oh, going to be awesome. joined with three other renal dietitians, and we're just going to be chatting. Uh, so if you want to join that, f find me on Instagram, uh, plant.powered.kidneys on Instagram. And uh, I will see you guys there. You guys can send us questions. You're going to be answering questions from uh, the people that are watching us. And you'll be able to meet other renal dietitians. And these are dietitians that specialize in renal nutrition. They help people with kidney disease. One of them focuses on kidney stones. One of them is another like me that does the plant-based diet for kidneys. Uh, and then Maria, like I mentioned, Puerto Rico, she also focuses on the more plant-based and healthier eating, but you have a menu of dietitians to be chatting with and, and connecting with. That is awesome. And another great resource for everyone out there that has kidney disease. The more you learn, the better you'll be prepared to understand what's important, how to make the better decisions. And that's really what kidney disease comes down to, making decisions. Do I want to eat this? I want to eat that. I want to go for a walk. Don't want to sit here on the couch and chill in front of Netflix again. It's all those little decisions. All and those di choices. dietitians, the number one thing that I ever did that helped me was working with the renal dietitian. I learned so much and made so much progress. All right. I'm going to wrap this up. Otherwise I'll be up here on my soapbox forever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do the same. I do the same thing, James. I do the same thing. <laughs> I cannot wait for COVID to get over with, and I should be able to get my vaccine in two weeks. Um, oh, cool. I cannot wait for COVID to be over with, you guys. I'm going to be going all over the place and talking like this. I want to. I want to travel, go see you guys in different cities, mm -hmm. and share my story and motivate you and encourage you and kind of crush all those awful websites that are out there that are all negative about kidney disease. We're um, selling snake oil. Yes, don't buy any of that. So all of you out mm -mm. there who are new, none of it works. Believe me, none of it. It's all, all wasting your money and could even hurt you. All right, yeah. we're gonna wrap this up. Jen is here every single Tuesday 
helping all of us with kidney disease live and love life. I'll see everybody in the next video. Bye. Thanks, Jen. See you Bye. on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs>